Okay, it's just preparing. And we are live, I think. Got it. Hello and welcome to Subaculture, um, our monthly event featuring live music and live poetry readings. And we've got a fantastic lineup of talent tonight. We have readings from Anne McDonald, Billy Fenton, Jessica Trainer, and Joanne McCarthy. And we have live music from EJ May. And I'll throw a tune in there myself, but don't let that put you off. Um, so yeah, and if you're uh, if you're on the tweet machine, um, Subaculture is now on Twitter. At Subaculture One is our handle, so you can uh, follow us there and um, catch up on what's going on in the next few months. We've got lots of really good stuff coming up in the next few months. Uh, we have the man who Hot Press called possibly the most read poet in Ireland, Kevin Higgins. And we also have Rosamond Taylor, who is bringing a new book out, a book of poetry out with uh, Banshee Press later in the year. So we're delighted to have Rosamond coming as well. And lots of other great stuff. So um, check, out, check us out on Facebook and on Twitter to uh, see everything that's happening there. So I'm going to kick off proceedings with June. And this is... An original song. This is called Last Time I Saw You, Michelle. Last time I saw you, Michelle, you swore you'd never set eyes on me again. But I tried to tear. I wished you well the last time I saw you, Michelle. We were painting the streets for parades. We walked in silence for what seemed like days. I took your hand and you said, go to hell. The last time I saw you, Michelle. Told me what I done to you, and I told you what I done to myself. There wasn't much in it, but you won in the end. The last time I saw you, Michelle. dress from the thrift store I'd seen it so many times before that day was like I saw it for the first time the last time I saw you Michelle I try not to think too much on those days when we were stupid and young but I'd give all my wisdom to be back there again. The last time I saw you, Michelle. Yeah, I'd give all my wisdom to be back there again. The last time I saw you, Michelle. Okay, and we're off. Uh, let me see. Okay, we're going to kick off straight into uh, reading then. And we're, our first reader is going to be Anne MacDonald. Anne MacDonald is an award-winning writer and spoken word poet. She has performed in Dublin and London and is a regular reader on open mics in Ireland, the US and the UK. She has been published in print and online publications and broadcast on RTE Radio. Her collection of poetry, Crow's Books, was published in 2021. Hello, Anne. Hello, Derek. 
Um, thank you so much. Just a bit like the Eurovision. Hello <laughs> from Bennystown County Mead. Um, 12 points all around. 12 points. This point, Ireland. <laughs> um, delighted to be here and thank you so much. And it's so lovely to see events like this happening now as we're coming out of a very strange couple of years. Um, and tonight I'm going to do three poems, uh, one that might be sad and the others that aren't so sad. But the first one that I want to do is from the fabulous uh, Blue Mondays anthology that was recently released by the Blue Mondays group in Cork uh, to raise funds for the Simon community, a fabulous group of poets and artists down there. And um, there was some comments to some people thought there might be too many fucks in this poem. But I showed it to women who don't sleep and they said there's not enough in it. So this is dedicated to every woman who doesn't get a good night's sleep. And uh, it's called The Day is Waiting. But it's a true story. I wish today for the jackdaw who has found his voice and chosen to greet the dawn with his own rendition of the morning chorus to fuck off to the backfield, at least until the rest of us have realized it's morning. Yawning through a cup of tea, far too strong for me, the bag left in too long. I watch sleepy pigeons eat fallen scraps of flat balls picked to bits by greedy starlings onto wet grass. And they, like me, seem to say, it's a bit of kip when it's still too dark. Really too much to ask? I know that he or she is new to the world, the jackdaw, and probably thinks they're the dog bollocks of an alarm clock. But they could call their heads off in the garden hedge or trees of nearby woods instead of on the window ledge of my bedroom. And I assume the other birds wanted to shut the fuck up too because the blue tit just wants to eat a bit of breakfast at the feeder. And if I didn't know better, I would think the pair of doves were hung over, waddling around on the same wet grass in the same almost dark. We can't keep this up. I tell the jackdaw through the glass, but he or she just turns its arse to me and calls away to start the day with notes that scrape the inside of my brain. And I know that no matter what I say or do today, tomorrow morning we'll start the whole fucking interchange again. He or she will sing the arrival of the dawn out of tune, out of fucks to give for women of a certain age whose only chance at sleep is just before the day breaks. It's like they're saying, get up to fuck, the day is waiting. Now, deep in my heart, I know the bird is happy. And when my tired bones and foggy brain agree to write off the sleepless night, I see the gift of dawn I have been given. And I know the singing jackdaw is right. So that's an ode to any woman who never gets a good night's sleep, which I think is many of us at a certain age. And uh, the next two poems I'm going to read are from Pro's book. Thank you very much, Derek. It came out in, in the middle of a pandemic, um, but so has many, many poetry books. So I'm just delighted to be able to read from it. And in the middle of the pandemic, I moved back here to Bettystown where I grew up and ran out of as a teenager thinking I knew everything. And now that I'm older, I realized that I knew fact all. And I wanted to read this tonight because it's about my mother. And she had a massive stroke at 62 and then developed stroke induced dementia, which I think has touched so many families. And this was written in the early few months after she had her stroke. She went on to live a good 15, 16 years. But this was in that awful painful time that many families find themselves in when somebody that was full of life is changed utterly. So it's called Time and Time Again. My mother took an age to walk across West Street on a Saturday. She would stop and talk and start again, relaying the same particular story while we would hop from one foot to another, freezing cold and gawking into Tully's misted window. In later years, she brought back packs of spangles from shopping trips to Newry on the bus and nervous and excited coming home, relaying close encounters with the army. Bags would burst with bargain packs of Omo. She wore a purple sweatshirt playing football with knee-high socks to hide her varicoses. The photo made the Drogheda independent. I was 10 and scarlet. She was 37. 
She drove a Honda 50 going to work and dishwashed into early hours for cash and tinfoil packs of midnight chips and rashers. A truce to eat by mutual, mutual agreement because truth be told, we fought like cats and dogs and many times I hated her. And I'm damn sure now she must have hated me. In later years, she doled out labelled parcels of rhubarb stewed and frozen packed and lumps of meat and loaves of bread and tinfoil plates of proper dinners. Visits home here were never ending lucky dips of things that might be used or useful. You never knew. At 62, the labels are illegible now. Speech is savaged and depleted. Stature shrunk and bent by aneurysm. Frightened eyes and limbs like lead. And I just can't get around it in my head that a more humane condition would be to be dead. The gale of wind that I remember, giving out and giving, doing, making, sowing, baking, going off to knock or out to swim, spends hours now in rehabilitation, weeping quietly, trying to say enormous. Now, I would love to walk the length of West Street on a Saturday, to stop and hop from one foot to the other and hear her say the same thing over again and then again for the sheer joy of talking. And I would gladly freeze in winter's rain to hear her tell her stories time and time again. Thank you. And that was that was for Peggy, uh, who thought all poetry was bollocks, but she would nonetheless, I'm sure, appreciate the fact that she's remembered. And my last poem um, is about a man that I was very fortunate to meet in the very last months of his life. And we had many conversations about the fact that a lot of young people think old people were born old and that we're all gobshites and that uh, we didn't live. And he lived an extraordinary life and he moved as many people did in the 70s from um, the west of Ireland to Dublin to work in the civil service. Although he always told me that any work that happened was a pure coincidence. He'd no recollection of most of much of it. So um, he's not with us anymore. But this is my ode to Harold. Um, I'm never sure if what he told me was the truth, but, you know, it, it made good listening. So this is Harold in the hospice. It made him tired to think about putting his teeth in to bite an apple. He didn't care if he took a pill or not. The pills they gave him now were for his bowels. He wondered if the nurse had ever taken acid. Did the Filipino orderly who always smiled ever climb a tree at dawn high on coke to see if he could hear electricity? Did the doctor ever smoke a joint or eat a brownie before the entrance exam for the civil service? No one was more surprised than Harold himself when he got that job. Stamping forms for years in sandals and a cheesecloth shirt, a head like Hollyhead on Mondays, coked off his tits in Harford Street on Fridays. Getting locked into the downstairs bathroom of Chivago's, which was walled with mirrors, sent him off a cliff edge. They called it a once-off psychotic episode. Locked him in St. Eta's for a week and he remembered then being glad of the rest. Crawling into the luggage space of an intercity bus leaving Dublin to start a new life as a cobbler in Belfast was a great idea at the time. Fueled by drinking absinthe, smoking weed, freed by an overweight, overwrought bus driver, Harold hitchhiked home from Drogheda at midnight. The damage to his lungs from the diesel was severe. The hospice comfort dog was a cross between a St. Bernard and a Labrador. His eyes looked straight ahead as bony yellowed hands and the almost dead stroked his back and pulled his ears. His name was Titan and he was commonly known to have the patience of a saint. But Harold wondered, was the days when Titan thought, ah, oh, fuck this, this kid is full of sick people. So he called the mongrel to his bedside and in a last act of defiance or enlightenment, he slipped the dog of Allium. Thank you very much, and thanks so much for the chance to be part of this wonderful event, Derek. Thank you so much. Well done, well done, and that was absolutely brilliant. Well done. You have such a wonderful delivery uh, of the poems as well. Um, I was just reminded when you said um, about leaving, because you thought you were so clever and, and uh, you knew so much. I was watching um, 
uh, Bruce Springsteen live on Broadway the other night and he said um, all his songs were about leaving and uh, born to run and blah 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 and all this and he said that um, he now lives 10 minutes from where he, he was born and he said uh, but I guess you know born to come back doesn't quite have the same ring to it. <laughs> you know what I live about four fields from where I grew up and I'm damn glad of it now let me tell you. So, but that's yeah. it isn't it. Now yeah. before uh, we, we move on I have to ask you as I ask everybody uh, is there something at the moment that you're obsessed with or loving um, anything in uh, TV, movies, music, anything at all, books? Yeah, I, to be honest, um, and I'm not really sure why the, why this uh, song keeps coming to me, but I keep playing it a lot. I, I just love the song Moon River. Okay. And um, I think because the world is in such turmoil, and when I was a child, I read Huckleberry Finn many, many times, inside out and upside down. And that song reminds me of it. And I just put it on, and I've actually put it on YouTube and I put it on the kitchen. Um, I think it's just such a beautiful, beautiful, simple song. And uh, and that's that's for the last two or three weeks, that's what I've been listening to. So I was I was smiling when you asked me because I thought, can think I'm off the wall because it's not. No, that's actually episode. really lovely. That's just kind of like a little bit of um something to to calm the nerves and yeah, to, to, kind of just yeah, make everything go away for, for three minutes. Like yeah. Well, that's, and, it. Uh, that's where I'm absolutely at. gorgeous song. Yeah. yeah. You. Thanks so much, Anne. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Okay, we're going to stick with the um, poetry for uh, our next guest. Our next guest is Billy Fenton. Billy Fenton writes poetry and short stories. His work has been published in the Irish Times, Poetry Ireland Review, The North, Irish Independent, Cronogue, Honest Ulsterman, Abridged, Acumen, and many others. He was shortlisted for a Hennessy Award in 2018 and was appointed by Poetry Ireland in 2021 as a Poet Laureate for Carrick on Shore. Hello, Billy. Hi, Derek. And how are um, you? Pretty good. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. And hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to do um, three poems. The first two are somewhat dark and the last one is a bit lighter. So um, the, the first one, um, I kind of have an interest in things like uh, folk history and folk spirituality. Um, so th this poem is one of the poems I've kind of written that kind of explore that kind of te theme and it's called Cursing Stone. And I suppose the reason I've chosen this poem is that the idea of a cursing stone is, makes an interesting story to start with anyway, before I even get into the poem. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of what a cursing stone is, it's kind of a thing that existed in kind of uh, Ireland, um, probably up to the, you know, the early part of the 20th century. Um, and uh, basically it could be used to send good wishes or bad wishes to somebody. Uh, so basically you could curse somebody if you wished, or you could send them good wishes. And the most famous one was on Tory Island. Um, I used to live actually in Donegal, opposite Tory Island for many years. Um, and um, the revenue, uh, basically, where the tax people from England were coming to collect tax on Tory, and Tory people didn't like everybody, didn't like paying tax. And this is in the 19th century. Um, so they decided what they'd do is they would use their cursing stone to curse the ship so the ship wouldn't arrive. But unfortunately, the ship sank and um, many people drowned. Um, from what reports I know of, 52 people potentially drowned from, um, from and in the sinking of this particular ship, the HMS Wasp. Um, and obviously after that, the parish priest basically took the stones and threw them into the sea and they've never been seen since. So they're completely disappeared. So the one I came across was on Cahar Island. There are other ones around Ireland, but this particular one in this particular poem was I came, I encountered in Cahar Island and it was quite a beautiful object. Um, but this is about my encounter with a cursing stone uh, on Cahar Island, which is off the coast of Mayo between Inish Turk and sort of Croke Patrick. Um, and Cursing Stone. On the boat to Cahar Island, the boatman said, you turn it over and recite your curse. I think of the custom ship that sank off Tory Island, killing 52, after the locals used their stone to plant a curse. I smile to myself, bemused by what men can believe. In the falling church of Patrick, on a makeshift altar, 
between a ballon of water and a pile of rusting coins, a brightly colored conglomerate stone smoothed into roundness by the churn of the sea. I touch its coldness, afraid to turn it over, afraid to pretend ill words. I hesitate at the doorway, tempted to return to show what can't be true. Outside, the wind is shivering, sea speckled with broken bread. Patrick's mountain pyramids its fingers into a razor gray sky, calls out a prayer to an unseen God. Above the beach, three gulls tear a lamb to pieces. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, um, is called, well, it was published as Water. I was thinking this morning when I was thinking about the idea of history that maybe a better title for it might be a short history of water. Um, so it's water anyway at the moment. <laughs> um, so this is kind of more of a personal poem and the, 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 the last line, and it's actually a sonnet. So the last two lines in it were actually an instruction that were given to me um, by somebody. Um, so it's called Water. When we were children, we sat in hot water for as long as we could until our fingers became wrinkled and raw. We held them up, boasted about how old we had become. A lad not much older than me lay on the slipway, white as a breaking wave, his body as still as a sea polished rock. In Boldstrand, my first sight of death. I think of your love of water, the taste of salt on your skin, or your hand trailing in the sea as you kayak along the shore, or wind puffing out to your sails. I spent my last year drowning, you said, don't spread my ashes on water. So the last one is lighter. Um, and um, I kind of came back to me, this is the first poem I actually got published a few years back. And um, it kind of came back to me, I was reading uh, in, the, in the, the latest edition of the Moth magazine, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, at the interview with Joelle Taylor, who won the T.S. Eliot Prize recently. And um, she says at the end of it, um, we really uphold, we uphold the standard of a poem which says the most uh, in the least lines, and that's absolutely commendable. But then she also says, but in doing so, we've forgotten chaos, and out of chaos came planets, out of chaos came you, and so on. So she was kind of advocating for the idea of chaos in, in, a, in a piece of art, I suppose, really, as opposed to being perfectly polished. And this is the, the poem I wrote some years ago uh, called Cracked Voices, and it's about musicians that I am... Um, really admired um, through, all through my life, I suppose, since it was about maybe 20 anyway. And they were always somewhat imperfect. They weren't kind of, they didn't have the perfect voice. They weren't afraid to make mistakes and show mistakes and so on. And I really admired them for that. And they seemed to be much more emotion in their work um, than, um, th than a lot of the other, you know, where a band goes into a studio and spends a year making an album um, and really polishes it. These all be, it's not that that's, that is also good, but this, these, these kind of ones always, I always like them a lot more for some reason. And it's called Cracked Voices. Um, it was on my father's old Normande radio that I first heard your jazz. Your trumpet mournfully rippled across my little bedroom, broke over my mind and we were brothers. It was on a cassette player in a house in Belfast that I first heard your flamenco. I didn't understand your words, but your voice was tangled and raw. It gurgled up from some dark cave and spat its pain into the Belfast night. It was in an old LP in a cork boarding house that I first heard you sing. You sang of strange fruit and many ordinary things in a voice almost broken, in a voice almost sweet. Cracked voices, not polished, not perfect, not afraid to risk, not a role model to be heard, just ordinary to the core, just dazzling for the heart. Thank you, Sunni. Well done, Billy. Brilliant. Um, and I, 
can I ask? Obviously, Billie Holiday was one of them. Was there? Are there, who, are there other ones in that poem? Uh, yeah, Miles Davis is in the first chapter. Or sorry, the first stanza. Um, yeah. And the, the second stanza then would be uh, El Cameron. I don't know if you mightn't be familiar with him. El Camaro de Ilas, who was yeah. a Spanish flamenco singer. Um, so yeah. they're the three that are in it. Yeah. And Billy as well, yeah, of course. And Billy, yeah. yeah. And I have to say, I love um, something I love about uh, these kind of events when people read poetry or, or, or tell stories is I always learn something new and I had never heard of a cursing stone before tonight. Do you need to go to Car Island now if you I'm, want to set your course? <laughs> I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that I now know about a cursing stone because that's amazing. I can't believe that. That's absolutely amazing. What did the ship actually crash like? And, and it sank, yeah, but obviously whether it had anything to do with the stone, it did sink. Yeah, yeah. So, um, that's so cool. That's, that's, that's up to your own belief whether it's... Uh, <laughs> But it was funny when you go into the church, you know, you kind of be tempted to turn it over, but you're kind of afraid just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> okay, Billy, is there something that you are obsessed with or loving at the moment? Um, I was kind of obsessing over this question since you said you emailed me about it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't really think of anything particularly. I was kind of today and yesterday, I was listening to a lot to Seeger Ross because they're obviously coming to Dublin in the last, in the end of the year. So, yeah. so I was you kind of really listening visit, to a lot of their albums. Hmm? You'll be paying them a visit then, will you? I will, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So there, that's what's on your radar at the moment. Uh, for yesterday and today. Yeah. And your question, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. I like that I'm on your mind, Billy. <laughs> Thanks so Thanks. much, Billy. Thanks, Terry. Okay, we're going to switch over to, uh, we're going to have a little bit of music. And EJ May is a Waterford-based singer-songwriter from Clonmel, County Tipperary, originally, who graduated from BIM Dublin with a BA music degree in creative musicianship. Along the way, EJ has performed at many established music venues, including Whelan's, Drop Dread Twice, and Fibber McGee's. During the past two years, she occupied her time in lockdown by becoming a member, a board member of a Danish songwriting group. She gave me the name of the Danish songwriting group, but I am not attempting to read it out. Um, but she became a board member of this group and often hosted online open mics and live stream concerts with the group. And her debut single, very exciting, will be released later this year. Hello, EJ May. Hey, Derek, how are you? And so tell us a little bit about your single first before we get a song from you. Well, I don't know. I've been sitting on um, songs for the last four years, I'd say now. Like I was putting it off before COVID happened. So I haven't decided which one I'm going to release yet. But um, first, but I, I, I want to release like maybe three, three singles before Christmas. So. Fantastic. So <laughs> will you be uh, going into the studio to record them, recording them yourself? Yeah, I, well, like, I, I don't think I'm confident enough to do it all on my own with my computer but like I, I know yeah. a little production just to make like some demos and have my ideas brought across yeah and then take it into the studio yeah yeah brilliant okay all right take it away um so first song I'm gonna sing is based on an old movie that um I watched for the first time during the one of the first lockdowns we were in it's a black and white movie and it's called as time goes by so maybe you can guess the song from the the chorus <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
how you're watching the takeoff as you left standing on the runway. After putting your life on the line, she said with a tear in her eye, soaring up further and higher, till she's out of your sight as time goes by. As time goes by. Done. Fabulous. That's gorgeous, Ellie. Um, and Casablanca is just one of those movies that you just think like it's perfect for uh, for during a lockdown for a start. <laughs> it's a perfect yeah. lockdown movie. But I also imagine it as just one of those like rainy Sunday afternoon movies that uh, will come on like BBC Two or something on a Sunday afternoon, and you just sit down and watch it. It's great. Um, so well, we're going to have another song from you later. But um, before I leave you, I'm going to ask question now is there something that you're obsessing about or loving at the moment anything at all in particular there's this one artist um she's a songwriter from la but i honestly don't know if i'm pronouncing her name right um it's okay. m and then b-e-i-h-o-l-d but it, i think it's m Behold. okay um, but she has a like i could be completely butchering that but <laughs> song um called numb little numb little bug and i just i love the the music video and everything like i think she's like really quirky artist that's you know quite poppy but like not mainstream pop okay spell spell it out again for us e m b e i h o l d so it's okay like, like e m yeah. probably short for emma or something i don't know and yeah behold or behold i'm not okay sure. fabulous okay i had never heard of her myself but i will be checking it out okay thanks a million and we'll we'll have another song from you soon later thanks Ali. okay back to the poetry and next up we have jessica trainer jessica trainer's debut liffy swim was shortlisted for the strong shine award the quick was a 2019 irish times poetry choice Awards also include the Ireland Chair of Poetry Bursary and Hennessy New Writer of the Year. She's poet in residence at the DLR Lexicon. Her third collection, Pit Lullabies from Blood Axe Books, is a Poetry Book Society recommendation. And I'm delighted to say she's, I believe she's going to be reading some Pit Lullaby, some of the, the works from Pit Lullaby tonight. Hello, Jess. Hi, Derek. And um, of course, uh, just newly crowned poetry editor of Banshee Literature. Oh, yes. also. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to put that in the bio. I know. I Come on, now. we have to listen to yeah. like that. <laughs> I know it's been a it's been a lovely it's been a lovely week for announcements and things like that. Okay. And then uh, the book launch is coming up next week as well of the collection. Uh, Fabulous. Featuring... The book launch is on the 30th of March, am I right? 30th of March at Hodges Figgis at six o'clock and everybody's welcome. Um, restrictions are lifted. It's a free for all. So <laughs> have some pandemonium and the best night of your lives. Um, <laughs> but if you can't <laughs> make it um, and people who can't get to it, we're also doing an online launch. Um, which will be featured, I think, on the Blood Axe Facebook page. You'll find the link to it there. Um, but that'll be on the 24th. And that's myself and Monitza Alvi and Amali Gunasakara doing a, a reading, the three of us together. Um, so mm-hmm. if you can't, if you're not around Dublin, um, do have a look at that. It's it's free. And if you can't watch it on the night, you can watch it back. Um, so that's all the bases covered, I think. Brilliant. Uh, OK, take it away, Jess. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to read a couple of poems from Pit Lullabies. Um, which is a book that I've been working on now for a couple of years. Um, 
over the course of which I've had two kids. And um, the book is really kind of an attempt to explore um, some of the darker and the stranger and the more, more difficult aspects of, of new motherhood. Um, because I think, you know, every generation comes to motherhood afresh because none of us can listen to our own mothers, no matter how great their advice is. You know, we kind of go, nobody told me um, as our mothers go, well, I think I might have. But, you know, I, I personally, I suppose in my poetry, I'm interested in always kind of probing the, the slightly surreal and the and the strange. And um, so that's some of the focus of this book. Um, and I also wanted to talk about some of the more difficult aspects that I think we uh, gloss over a lot uh, in terms of coming towards motherhood and dealing with motherhood. And I think we talk about these things privately, but still, strangely enough, they're not discussed a lot uh, in public life. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of short poems from the book. Um, and I'm going to start with one called Anatomy Scan, which was inspired by the anatomy scan I had of my second daughter, who's a year old now. And um, in the rotunda, they've gotten this whole new machine. You know, the kind of ultrasound they'd had before was this bockety old yoke that was all black and white. And they had this new machine that they were just they were like madly in love with the machine and it showed everything in different colors and they were going there's the kidneys and there's that and you know as, and they were delighted with themselves and I found it deeply creepy <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, here's some deep deep creepiness um, in the form of anatomy scan let's begin with a shroud darkened by time pushed aside to show your bones filigree the ultrasound probes and digs as you slither in and out of focus, sockets gaping like a Halloween ghost through a sheet. The hole of your stomach, the chomp of your heartbeat hungering below my gut. Perfect cerebellum, a very nice spine. There, the kidneys, little dark pockets of need. Colour flares across the screen, arterial flow through widening chambers, its rush exhausting. The eyeballs orbit, closed but watchful. Your twig arms flinch and flick. Your tiny jaws grin. Little lizard, you know something I've forgotten. Um... So another part of the whole kind of parenthood process um, for me was very much the kind of the, the, the terrible anxiety that it introduced into my life. You know, as people say to you, like, when you're a parent, you'll never sleep again. And it's not just due to the sleepless nights, like, you know, you'll never sleep again. You might have a bit of sleep maybe before they get into secondary school. And then once they're into teenage years, I think there's another, you know, 10 years of sleeplessness. Um, but one of the things I am very seriously concerned about and have been uh, quite actively involved in campaigning around and things like that is um, violence towards women in Irish society. And I think it is um, a major problem, as I think it is in, in many societies. I don't think we're, we're particularly special in that regard. Um, but one of the things that I find kind of interesting is our response still as a society that's suffered many traumas and um, that our response is still to kind of look at terrible events and go, OK, that's over, moving on. And I don't think we, we address the behaviours that lead to these issues. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of this again in the media responses to how media responses differ in terms of which women are killed and when and how and the circumstances. You know, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, and a couple of years ago, I was invited um, by uh, Claire Cunningham to write a poem for uh, BBC Radio 4, along with a bunch of other great Irish poets, um, but responding to an event in Irish society in the style of Jonathan Swift. So it had to be something dynamic in Irish society, and we had to respond to it with a kind of a dark satire. And I was thinking about violence against women. And I thought, OK, what is the kind of typical response of Irish society to these kind of events? Um, and the poem is called A Plea for the Sanctification of the Ditches of Ireland. And it has a little epigraph from Patrick Kavanagh. Ashamed of what I loved, I flung her from me and called her a ditch. Patrick Kavanagh, Innocence. In these difficult cases where the death site is unknown, where guesswork festoons each hedgerow, bog hole, car boot, in caution tape for a mother sucked through the estuary's throat and into the sea. In these dark times when our men are driven by swallowed sorrows to make a butcher's block of the hearth, the best course of action is to sanctify the sites where these unfortunate women found their rest. 
If we worship them here, maybe their fractured ribs will knit like a no Moses basket to shelter the heart. Contusions to the chest, legs, forearms will fade like darkness licked back into an inky horizon. Broken necks will kink into place with a click as neat as a car boots closing. And mirrored in the meadows satin dew will be a host of little virgins, mothers of the field, ditch, cistern. Each little breakneck, each strangled waif will be a May Queen, a fly-tipped boreen her altar, and her voice will pour like honey over the field, sweet as blackbird song rippling the wooded glen. Oh, raise your hands in supplication, chant her name across the evening in a round. Mother Ditch, prepare a bed for us among the nettle leaves. Oh, Mother, dip your net for us amongst the choppy waves. Oh, Mother Ditch, we pine for you until the moon is full and then we see your face appear in every bog pool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read two, uh, two more short poems um, and uh, this book is called Pit Lullabies and it's kind of, um, it's got this fractured sequence of attempted lullabies throughout it which I've called Pit Lullabies and they deal I suppose with my own struggles with postnatal depression and with all of the kind of difficulties and anxieties that um that go with that and um, but at the end of the book I do manage a lullaby and um, so I'm going to read you one of the pit lullabies and then a final lullaby pit lullaby when we turn off the light and I hold you close your face becomes a puzzle a wisp of hair settling on a cheek an eyebrow like a capstone sinking in a restless sea. Here I whisper to you broken thoughts that settle on the tangle of our limbs. Mog sat in the dark and thought dark thoughts, I say, because it's the only thing in any of your books I recognize as true, a beast alone out of doors and far from home. I lie in the dark and think dark thoughts while your feet push my thighs away. I make a weapon of the weight of my bones. There are so many hours between us and the morning. Um, and then finally, lullaby. I have a lullaby for you at last. So lie beside me, hold my hand, follow me through the night's amber lens to Bull Island. Here the seals are waking from their sleep rolling into the surf where in blue black they'll stretch the land ache from their muscles. Here the only touch is water, moonlight on scale, dazzle of bubbles, blubber's cape and fish blood's meagre warmth. These are my notes, the strand our stave, our music rises and falls, we are waveform, we are sea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic, Jess. I, I love that line in the last one where you said um, that the the character having the dark thoughts was the only thing you you uh, <laughs> associated with basically in the children's books. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Absolutely I wonderful. I, I have to say I'm obsessed with Mog the Cat and I've been <laughs> like I remember them from my childhood and I inflicted them on my daughter um, and she allows it, you know, but I just... Yeah. Forgive my ignorance if uh, if it is, but is pit lullabies a phrase or is this your own phrase or was that, is, is that? I think it's my own. I'm okay. terrified yeah. to Google what, so it So what then. is a pit lullaby? I, I thought, I, was, I wasn't sure if it was something else. Uh, uh. No, no, no. I was just kind of thinking about, it's funny, I actually was inspired a little bit um, by, um, and there's another poem in the book that references this. Uh, I was reading this Rob McFarlane book called Underland, um, which is really interesting. It's about all these subterranean spaces. And there was, um, he was talking about a, a mine in Wales, an abandoned mine in Wales, where people have been dumping cars for years. They just push the cars. I mean, you know the way in, in the Aran Islands, they push the cars into the sea. You know, in this, in this mine in Wales, they just push the cars in. And if you go, the lower you go down, the older the cars get. Um, and I kind of just I love this idea of what we do and how we feel and the times and places where we are, even when we're walking about above ground, we're a little bit subterranean. So, yeah, yeah, that's subterranean no, that's, blues. It's, it's such a great title as well. Um, OK, what are you obsessing, loving at the moment, Jess? 
Do you know, I, I've i been really, um, I'm really sad that Mark Lanigan died. I, we've oh, talked I about music yeah. before and I've, I've been a massive Mark Lanigan fan for years. And um, like, you know, I, I had I've always been a fan. I, I think I've seen him play live more than anyone else because he played, he plays a lot in Ireland. So we used to, myself and my partner, have gone to see him probably every year and a half for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, Because we both love live music and we go to loads of gigs if we can, but he would just always come along and it'd be cheap and we'd go and see him. And and I wrote an essay um, a while back about that kind of, it, it talks about my Mark Lanigan fandom, but also tells the story of, of a cousin of mine who, who died of a heroin overdose. And um, so it kind of talks a bit about Mark Mark's story and then my cousin's mm. story. Um, and how they both ended very differently. But um, he had actually been in touch with me about it because I, I knew he had Kerry connections, but he, he was living in Ireland for the last two, three years of his life. I think he moved over during the pandemic. Sorry, yeah. And um, Rick O'Shea had tweeted about it and added him and I nearly died, you know? And I thought, oh, that's nice, but like, he's never going to read it. And then the guys from Talca, the journal who, um, who published it just sent me a message and they were like someone called Mark Lanigan who's just bought our journal and then he sent me a message you oh. know in his very kind of an email like um, you know I'm I, I, your essay is really moving and I was like ah! <laughs> <laughs> and how long ago was that just probably the middle of last year oh yeah so and I'm the kind of person like I would be very shy about approaching my heroes mostly because like I don't think you know I knew a few I, I've since spoken to a few people who knew him like he could be a cranky old bollocks oh know? yeah I heard that he wasn't, yeah. I wasn't yeah. the most friendly and forthcoming man in the world. So I wouldn't have been in a rush to fling myself at him to be like, I'm your biggest fan. Um, but we had that, like I have the little DM on Twitter still on my phone. That and, is so um, wonderful. I'm just gutted. Like, a, you know, I probably, even if he'd still played, I wouldn't have gone up to say hi to him afterwards, even after having, you know, known him, like, or met him or, t- or talked to him. But it's just like, it's funny, Anne, I was thinking like, I'm now the age your mother was when she was running around with the purple sweatshirt on and the, and the <laughs> socks, you know? And yeah. you do start as you're kind of inching towards that. It would have been lovely to see him one more time, having, yeah, yeah, having made that of, connection. It's the end of an era, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, me 100%. It's totally selfish, but it is that kind of like, okay, I saw I saw you for the first time when I was probably in my late teens and mm. now I'm pushing 40. And You're lucky that you got to see him so many times though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I lived in the UK, for a while like he played plays like Scotland and London yeah. and various places that I was so I saw him there as well and the kind of intimate yeah. venues that you would see him in you know yeah, well. yeah and he just stood there like he'd never talked to the crowd he always looked pissed off but he just played the <laughs> songs really well like you know and yeah. and he was a real craftsman and oh, so, such a voice such a voice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so that's okay, my well, kind of that's, the, that's great that's great and it's nice to remember Mark tonight thanks for that Jess thanks Derek okay um a little bit more poetry now from um, Joanne McCarthy. Joanne McCarthy writes is from Waterford, writes in both English and Irish. Her work is published in Poetry Ireland Review, Irish Independent New Irish Writing, Stinging Fly, Splunk, The Honest Ulsterman, and many more. She is an Arts Council Agility Award recipient 2021, a John Hewitt International Summer School Bursary recipient 2021, and a mentorship recipient from the Arts Office, Waterford City and County Council. Joanne is currently reading poetry at the Seamus Heaney Centre, Queen's University, Belfast, and she also co-edits a little thing called The Wax Lemon with some other fella. (laughs) Hello. Turn on your microphone. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. you Thank you. (laughs) Hello, everyone. And thank you. I've been really enjoying listening to everybody. Thank you for the invite, Derek. You're more than welcome. I'm going to let you take it away. I'm just going to say that I'm from Cork for all my Cork roots. (laughs) You know, Um, I'm going to start actually with with, um, a Cork, a poem about um, the place where I'm from. So this is called uh, Mora Fialach uh, Bannon Chlorine, and it's after recounts in the Irish Schools Folklore Collection from 1937 to 39. I was really intrigued by Mora Gallach and I heard a few things about her, so I had to go look her up, obviously. <laughs> um, Mora Gallach. It is true what you hear. She haunts the road two miles north of Ballanine at the One-Eyed Bridge. The tailor of our kit goes home every day at three o'clock for fear of passing her in darkness. The lord and women of Liscronine know all about her. An aunt belonging to them travelled north to Clannacilty to sell fowl. Now a clock in the house, she started off by moonlight 
mistaking brightness for early morning. She passed the bridge and Maura Gallop came flying out towards her, wailing. The cock in the crate started to flap and crow. Maura took fright and disappeared straight away. She went after a priest out by night on a sick call, jumping on the back of his horse. The horse died in the stable. No one knew the priest was dead in the bed until they leaned in close. The priest at Inneskeen says she's in penance for murdering unbaptized baby boys. They say she killed her husband as well. They say she confessed all this to the priest in Desert Surges. When asked why did she do such an evil thing, she flew up in the air in a ball of fire and came down to the ground in a show of sparks. This was work done by the fairies. Bitterling clothes is how she passes her time, beating clothes over the river rock to wash them. If she jumps on the back of a passing cart, she stops the horse from pulling and the horse gets stuck for the day. She could kill a horse, a man, a woman, a child or a priest. She can move in different forms. Travellers out by night carry holy water to put her to flight. The name Mora Gallagh is a terror to all by night. It's, um, Maura Gallagh, who I hope none of us ever have a misfortune to meet among her travels. I'm going to stay with my current um, vibe, and this is called Girls of um, Fair Hill, and it's after Catalyst Five. Take my hand, girl. I don't give a fiddler's for the talk of the town, for the twitching curtains and the nosebags would feck all else to talk about. We'll run hand in hand down Pana, and when we land on the bridge, we'll have our first kiss over the lee, hundreds more up Patrick's Hill, and thousands more up Chandon. We'll climb those rickety steps, my hand on your back, on your waist, on that fine ass. We'll lie down at the beams at the top of the tower, and I will taste every last bit of you. The four barefaced clocks will tell their lies, but not the bells. The bells will ring out for two fair hill girls and their infinite kisses. Uh, I don't really have a set list. I just have a little gathering of poems in front of me. <laughs> Surprise to me what's going to come next. <laughs> um, I'm obsessed with Clown um, I read, I don't know, ever since I first read Clown I love it. I love Deirdre. I love, I love the brothers. I love it all. So I have loads of different variations of poems from it, but this one is a new, well, I don't know how new it is, just a recent take. It's just called Deirdre. Nisha, when you walk, rock into town in those black treads, my heart opens like the hole in the thigh of my new blue jeans. The cloud of your Armani weakens me at the knees. Your ferocious glare freaks out all the boys. Come on, let's ditch this dive and head to Edinburgh instead. Flights are dirty about Dublin, you know I'm right. We'll meet up the cart gang, tear up the dance floor at the hive, and when we run out of cash, we'll gig for jobs at the fringe. So what if Connor bangs on saying I'm his? I'm I blue in the face telling you there isn't a prayer. He's feckin' ancient anyway. People have been setting up me and him since I was in nappies, but nobody asked me, did they? Come on, bring on all the lads. We'll get out of Dodge. Nisha, I go to the ends of the world for you. You with your green eyes, your hair black as my brand new docks, your red wine lips, and your skin white as my candlelight. Just hold, hold Deirdre there into, into the present. Um, okay, I have a little one, a short one. This is after, um, you know, the song, the Scottish Trout song, The, um, the Parting Glass. And it's also, um, yeah, I might want to say any more about it. It's called Gently Rise. Paper thin skin on my inner thigh dips and yields, softly calls. Your lips butterfly a seal I trace with the pads of my fingers. In the bar, we are Hellalil and Hildebrand, spilling goodbyes into lean and glance. Hear this the sweet kiss spot of my left thigh sings this parting for you. Um, I might just finish off one more, one more for the road. <laughs> this is called, um, This Is It. This is it. Now, when I haven't, Anna says, you look great, you've lost weight. My 20-year-old body siren sings through a tumbler of Hennessy. 
heading down the Atlanta highway in low slung citizen jeans. Float like a feather in a beautiful world, in a backless dress at the autograph ball. Got my head checked by a jumbo jet in combats and yellow lace docks. Here we are now, entertainers in hemp vest tops, blurred and sweat. I drop coins into the starting tomorrow jukebox. Ho oh, that I am for her slinky slots, her bogus pillow talk. Thank you. Thank you all. Well done. We're seeing, we've seen Nisha and Deirdre now and the girls of Fair Hill. We're seeing uh, uh, some bold women there now. <laughs> Breaking out of town. <laughs> I love it. What was the first one? The title of the first one? Oh, Maura Gallagh. I had never heard of Maura Gallagh either. Mm. Is she a Cork phenomenon? She's very, very West Cork, kind of Ross Carberry, Balanine, that kind of area. Okay, yeah. I like her. Okay. I don't want to meet her, but I, I like the. I don't want to meet her. <laughs> I, I like the story. Okay, have, uh, have you got a, a an obsession? Uh, something you're loving at the moment? I'm reading Paul Muldoon, uh, so that's like the rabbit hole. Um, and also, I'm listening to the Magnetic Fields um, on repeat because they're coming as well this summer. So um, I seem to have that flying around. I also read um, Claudia Rankin's Citizen lately, and. Um, that was really hard going and it just sparked loads of thoughts in my head and I'm thinking about the Irish language. She speaks a lot about microaggressions to race in, in America and it made me think about microaggressions to the language in our culture. So that's where my thoughts are at the moment. I'm really teasing that out and there's writing bubbling up around that, but it's just Excellent. at the moment. Lots of food for thought there and yes, I, I'm with you on the magnetic fields, fabulous stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Joanne. Thanks Derek. And we're going to have one more piece of music before we finish now with EJ May. Hey again. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to finish off on a song called Warrior. Um, and I guess it kind of touches on uh, what uh, one of Jessica was saying, well, a little bit with her poetry earlier. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of about empowerment and uh, if you're like fighting anything. Um, so, yeah, hope you like this. Look at me and what do you see? Something broken and incomplete. Well, you know I've been through it all, but I can take care of me. Cause I have faced many battles, came out the other side. No matter what will happen, I won't apologize. Cause I am, I am, I am a warrior. I am, I am a goddess. I am, I am stronger. Oh, 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 oh. I am, I am, I am a warrior. I am, I am a goddess. I am, I am stronger now that I know you got my back. I put my heart and soul into everything I take on, no matter what life may throw. I am my own weapon. We've all got our own fighter hiding deep down inside. You just gotta light that fire and take a stand tonight. I am, I am, I am a warrior. I am, I am a goddess. I am, I am stronger. Oh, 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 I am, I am, I am a warrior. You are, you are a goddess. We are, we are stronger. I won't, I won't back down. Never gonna, never gonna back down. I'm gonna keep on fighting for as long, as long as I can. I won't, I won't back down. Never gonna, never gonna back down. I'm gonna keep on fighting for as long, as long as I can. I am, I am a warrior, you 
are, you are a goddess. We are, we are stronger. Now that we found this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Eddie. That's got to be uh, up there for one of the uh, songs that's going to be recorded, I imagine. <laughs> Maybe someday down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. It's fantastic. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks. Thanks for having me there. Okay. And uh, thank you to everybody. Um, that's it. We've just come in just just a little over the hour. So I'm being very responsible and being and, and keeping it to an hour long program. I don't know. The first one was about an hour and a half. And it was kind of all over the place. So we're getting we're getting there anyway. Um, so uh, to, to Anne McDonald, to Brilly Fenton, to Jessica Trainer, to Joanne McCarthy, and to EJ May for a fabulous evening. And we will be back with Subaculture again next month. Until then, thanks for watching and take care. Bye-bye.